Hey there, it's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting dodo birds, leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button like your Brandon Davies. You have consent. And don't forget to also subscribe to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel. While you're here, let's get into it. Now that week five of the 2023-24 college basketball season is mostly in the books, there are exactly seven undefeated teams remaining. Arizona, Houston, Baylor. Oklahoma, Clemson, James Madison, and Ole Miss. That's because previously undefeated Colorado State, BYU, TCU, and Princeton all lost this week. And you might remember we actually opened Friday's episode on how BYU and Colorado State are two of the biggest surprises in the sport. They Mm -hmm. responded to our praise uh, by losing games roughly 24 hours later. We're back. Uh, That that was awesome. BYU lost at Utah 73-69. Colorado State uh, lost to St. Mary 64-61. Thanks for making us look smart, fellas. So again, there are now seven undefeated teams in the country. Arizona, Houston, Baylor are all schools that were expected to be great. Nothing surprising there or too surprising there. James Madison, rock solid mid-major. I now have, hey, better oh. late than never. I now have the Dukes oh. in the top 25 and one. They should win the Sun Belt. That leaves us with Oklahoma, Clemson, and Ole Miss, all of which had notable wins this weekend. Oklahoma beat Arkansas 79-70 to improve to 9-0. Clemson beat TCU 74-66 to improve to 9-0. And And Ole Miss won at UCF 70-68 to also remain undefeated. Dead leg, all of these teams were outside of the top 45 at Ken Palm in the preseason. Mm -hmm. I now, when the top 25 and 1 updates on Monday morning, will have them all in the top 25 and one Oklahoma will be 11th Clemson will be 14th Ole Miss will be 25th I apologize for the lengthy open but now I'll turn it over to you take Oklahoma Clemson Ole Miss who do you believe in why this is our poll question right now on this live Sunday evening edition of the Ion College Basketball Podcast so feel free to vote if you're chatting and following along in real time here I'll update that poll before we get out of the show uh you laid it out there I'm just gonna I I gotta I, I need to first of all I need to put in like 15 new drops on my board here. And I need an, I need an applause one because you finally you're a few weeks late, but you finally put James Madison. In hey, buddy, I, I know I know you I know <laughs> you've never been dumb enough to rank 26 basketball teams every morning. But I tell you, we are getting to the point where I'm like, you get to about 24 and you go, yeah. man, I don't know what else to do. I guess at some point I got to go with James Madison because yeah, I don't know. Not what else default. To do. They are not default. How dare you? <laughs> How I, dare you do that? To I the actually, I actually had a, a gift from uh, the basketball gods this morning. I needed a spot and I said, okay, this is going to be perfect. I'll put Princeton in. And if Princeton wins on Sunday afternoon at St. Joe's, they'll be undefeated <sighs> with a win over the St. Joe's team that beat Villanova and took Kentucky to overtime. And if they lose, I can just kick them right back out. So I had to kick them right back out because they lost. Mm-hmm. They let me down. Fail horn. Although good on St. Joe's, we're going to get to the undefeated teams. But I will say good on St. Joe's right now. Princeton's now nine and one. Uh, boohoo! It lost its its first game in six tries on the road. St. Joe's is eight and two, and giving some credence to the A10. If that continues, obviously we'll highlight Joe's in that conference more on the show. Uh, but just got to prove it a bit more here as we you know wind toward the back end of non-conference season. To your question, with the three teams specifically. Um, I would lean so okay. I would lean Clemson here, um, but they've all got a lot to uh, to write home about here. Uh, Oklahoma getting to nine and zero is something that nobody saw coming, uh, other than us when we spotlighted Oklahoma by virtue of, as previously mentioned, <laughs> a fan auction winning bid for our summer shoot around series. And so at that time, Oklahoma was well positioned outside the projected top fifty in the sport. Look up now. Sitting at 19th at Ken Palm right now, still with some preseason projections baked into that. But at 9 0 and winning 79 70 over Arkansas over the weekend, Musk got ejected from that game, by the way. He was on fire. Uh, but Oklahoma had it the whole, the whole way through. And to this point, the defense has been outstanding. I would say, in watching, I've, I've caught the Sooners play this season in the win against Iowa, the win against USC. The win earlier this week against Providence where it was, you know, a game early and then they just ran away from him. That was a game in Norman. And then the win against Arkansas here uh, in that was in Tulsa, I believe. Uh, Oklahoma is yet to play a road game, but it does have three wins on neutral courts against high major teams, uh, all of which are of top 70 ish variety. Iowa, USC and then Arkansas, Uh, Oklahoma not play on the road this season until January 10. 
at TCU. So there is a chance they've got UNC coming in 10 days. We'll see about that. But there is a chance they they can they can make it as the last unbeaten team, GP. Um, JV McCollum has been uh, a very efficient player so far this season. I, I, I you know, uh, Milos Uzan was a, a player that I was pretty high on. He's actually underperformed versus my expectations overall, but they are a, uh, they are a, a, a well-built, uh, and Musselman said this after the game, actually on Saturday, they, they, they just, they play well in their roles. Uh, the staff has been scouting well. Uh, Oklahoma has done has done well for itself. Um, uh, but I would still, having said that, and knowing what um, Ole Miss needed to really squeak out a win, but regardless, they got the win uh, on the road and to remain undefeated, it's it's impressive nonetheless. Chris Beard's team to get to this point at 9-0 um, with a road win against UCF. Uh, there are a lot of positive signs there. Flanagan's been awesome. And we'll see if, you know, the likes of Musa Cisse, who's not playing a ton yet, GP, but he's been cleared to play. And then they got Jamarian Sharp, a 7 5 dude. They could, they could come along. Clemson is my team that I buy the most in long term. It's the team that I was the highest on of the three going into the season. And it's the team that I think has the best player of anyone on any of those rosters. PJ Hall, for sure. PJ Hall, right now, fourth in the K Poi Player of the Year algorithm, by the way. And like Joseph Girard, who is who came from Syracuse and was, I think he's the all-time scoring leader in high school basketball history in the state of New York. And then he had like a solid career at Syracuse. You could argue maybe in totality, he might've fallen short of what expectations were as a, as a semi-local kid. But regardless, he was a guy and that went into the portal and had a good stroke. And you, you hope that he can come on your campus and be a, a real additional piece. He has absolutely been that playing alongside uh, Chase Hunter, who I really like as a point guard there. I like what they have. Ian Shefflin showed up big over the weekend as well in getting the win over TCU in the Battle of the Unbeatens. So you went long to start. I go long to answer you. Uh, I would like Clemson the most, and I think that Clemson should be in that discussion right now as a team that can compete to win the ACC. You heard me correct. I'm not just saying this for effect on December 10th. Trust me, I'm not saying stuff about Clemson for effect, okay? I think that Clemson right now is sitting at the table with the likes of Duke, Virginia, North Carolina, you know, Miami got rolled. I'll mention that in the, in the whip around later, but Miami got rolled um, earlier on Sunday by Colorado. So there's really no argument against Clemson having as strong of a chance as any team right now to win the ACC. I have Oklahoma ranked higher than Clemson and Ole Miss. But if I were trying to, if I were answering my own question, which one do I believe in the most? I think the context matters. And I think just Clemson's got a much easier life in the ACC than Oklahoma's got in the Big 12, yeah, or Ole Miss has got in the SEC. Like, Ole Miss can be legitimately good and get eat up in the SEC. Oklahoma can be legitimately good and get eat up in in the Big 12. I, I th- in other words, the way the all three of these teams are playing right now, if Clemson continues to play this way, they'll finish top four in the ACC. They just will, all right? If Oklahoma keeps playing at this level, like you don't know what's good. That could, this level could could take you to ninth in the Big Twelve or something even worse. And same thing for for Ole Miss and the SEC. So I'll I'll believe in Clemson more than the others, if only because Clemson, like we're almost to conference play, and they play in the easier conference if we're ranking all three conferences. On Oklahoma, you mentioned um, they could be thirteen and zero heading into the Big Twelve. It's really just going to come down to that North Carolina game, or at least I should say it should probably only come down to that North Carolina game. So 13 and 0, 12 and 1 heading into the Big 12 is a likely scenario. So let me ask you this mm-hmm. What does it take then in the Big 12 to get into the inside? Like if I tell you right now, uh, yeah. if I tell you right now, you don't know anything more than this, okay. Oklahoma goes 9 and 9 in the Big 12. It's in uh, with that, if it does. By the way, Oklahoma's beating teams by 22 points on average right now, so th- there's a lot to believe in there. But if you tell me that OU still goes 99 in the Big 12 after the start, and even toss in, toss in a loss to UNC, that's definitely going to be enough to get into the tournament. And let's just let's like you know, let's just say they win one game in the Big 12 tournament, that will be enough to get them in. Uh, okay, I'll, okay, I'll okay. Let me let me say this. You're exactly right. It's plenty enough to get them in. I bet you. Uh, I bet you the casuals, as they say don't understand exactly how much of a guarantee it is to get in at 500 that's nine quad one, that's almost certainly nine quad one wins and at worst like seven quad ones and two quad twos by the way okay so this sets me up for a trivia time okay here we go 
when was the last year? What was the last year a team finished at least 500 in the Big 12 and did not make the NCAA tournament? That's a great trivia. T- Dude, that's a wonderful trivia time. Because uh, this is great. You can just, like as this. if you were an Oklahoma fan right now, you can say, if we do this, we're good. Because because when was the last time somebody did this? And uh, what I mean, I couldn't, I, I, GP, I don't have the faintest idea. If it's going to be, if you're about to tell me that this happened in the past, uh, I guess I might believe it in the COVID year. Um, but I'm going to blindly say it's been the number one conference in seven of the past nine seasons, I think. So I'm going beyond that. I'll say a 500 team in the Big 12 not getting an invite to the dance. I'll give me 2010. It's 2014. Okay. Um, let me try and guess the team. 14, 500 in the Big 12. That's like two versions of the Big 12 ago. Um, I'll just say it was Oklahoma State. It was West Virginia. They went 9-9 nine and nine in the Big 12 in 2014, finished 17-16 and 16 overall, missed the NCAA oh, yeah, tournament. That's, yeah, that's, But quite literally every Big 12 team since then that has gone at least – take whatever happened in the, in the nine-league portion of your schedule, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but you get the point. If they then go 500 in the Big 12, they're in. And that, and if you're an Oklahoma fan, that is the greatest thing about this start is that it has set you up where we don't have to finish top four in the league or top six in the league. If we go 500 in our league, that is almost certainly going in, – in fact, in Oklahoma's case, it will definitely be, be good enough. So uh, just tremendous stuff we did. Uh, loyal listeners will know a bonus episode on Oklahoma in the preseason. We both um, acknowledged that we could envision them being good, but certainly that was uh, it looked like a team that would finish in the bottom half of the of the Big Twelve. Still might, but they have overachieved, exceeded all reasonable expectations. Off to a great start at OU. As for Clemson, nine and zero, and I'll be quick on this. Uh, they got wins over Alabama, TCU, Pitt, South Carolina. That's four wins over top 55 Kim Pom teams. Not nothing. Up next, they're coming down here to Memphis next Saturday. Kim Pom has a projected score in that one. Memphis 76, Clemson 75. So the Tigers' perfect record could be no more. The Clemson Tigers' perfect record could be no more this time next week. Regardless, if you're Brad Burnell, you start uh, your 14th year at Clemson on the hot seat and you win your first nine games, you're now ranked in the top 15 and the top 25 and one things are going really, really Give him a contract extension already. What are we waiting on? I'm um, seriously, get him a contract. I mean, probably try, we're trying to get that done. <laughs> hey, before, hey, before we, Hey, before we, before it'd be a good time to get a contract extension. It, it, it really, it really it'd be would. a terrific time uh, into that, uh, into that holiday spirit there. Um, um, Ole Miss real quick. Yeah. I, I didn't wake up this morning thinking I would have them in the top 25 and one, even if they won. Yeah, you got to have them there. Well, at some point, you just uh, – because the computer numbers left. are terrible still. I know, but there's seven unbeatens left. They're in a high major. I, I just think there's 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 no case against it at this point with this team. And, and, and tell me tell me this. They're 9-0 with a win over the Memphis team that then earlier today beat A&M on the road and also has wins over Michigan, Arkansas. I was actually – I was probably going to put them in no matter what, but at this point it becomes very, very easy. It's not just Ole Miss with bad computer numbers. Like Memphis could not go to Ole Memphis with the A and M and won easy. Couldn't go to Ole Miss and win. And Ole Miss is nine and zero. I'm just going to respect the nine and zero record with a win over Memphis and a road win over UCF, which as of right now in this moment would qualify as a quad one win. I don't know if this is updated for today in the moment right now, but Ole Miss being 86 at Torvik, accounting for not accounting for projection. This is in season remove the preseason bias 86 mm-hmm. and they're low at Ken Palm too. I based on getting to this point, I would just, you know, if they lose then you, then you bounce them out. They've got a, a game next weekend against a Cal team that almost pulled out a double OT squeaker against, against Butler. Um, but the resume isn't great, but you know, two road wins. I, I would, I, I don't think there's a case against it uh, where they should be in the AP rankings versus what, uh, computer models have them at it. That's two different discussions, and right. I don't, I don't get too, frankly, I don't get too uppity over rankings. I, I do like when it comes to James Madison and Princeton. We'll get it now because it lost because it does mean something big for those programs. Sure. And I think it's important to highlight those kind of teams when they do that, considering all of the cha- the scheduling challenges, let alone everything else going against them. But whether like Ole Miss or not is ranked on Monday doesn't matter to me. Um, b- 
But if I was a voter, I think when you consider that there's only seven teams left without a loss and uh, and what they've done, a couple of road wins in that, I, I would put them in, especially the, the win over Memphis, even though it's home, that would be the clincher for me. Yeah, there we go. So I'm uh, we're on the same page. I'll have them in the top 25 and one. And here's the thing. You say they, they you know, if they lose, you can get them out. Well, they might not lose for a minute. You know, they play Cal, Troy, Southern Miss, Bryant. Those are the next four. Could very reasonably be 13 and 0 when they play at Tennessee on January 6th. Good stuff. There we go. What a day to go to Tennessee. Can yeah. you now say January 6th without immediately thinking of January 6th? Uh, I, I, That's another one of those days that is now like 9-11, January 6th. Just, that will live in infamy. What do you want from me? Yeah, it's just a day that immediately I just, like if I'd have said January 7th, I wouldn't even have blinked. But I said January 6th and I started thinking of, of uh, capital stormers. Am I always going to be that way? Uh, probably so. As we get ready to go to break here, poll question in the live chat as we're about 16 minutes in, which team are you buying stock in most long-term over the course of the season? The leading team, is the team that I am behind Oklahoma, or excuse me, Clemson is winning at 46%. Oklahoma at 38% right now of the vote. Ole Miss, a distant third, uh, 16%. So Tigers, Tigers winning that poll. Arizona and Purdue also both won this weekend, and that sets up a fabulous game for next weekend. We're going to talk about that next. But first, can I get a word from my partner? Let's go. Wake up to football highlights and news from around the world with the one and only Morning Footy Team. Rise and shine, football fans. Welcome to Morning Footy. Start your all-day football craze with Morning Footy, part of the all-new Galazzo Network. Arizona and Purdue both won this weekend. Sets up an awesome game next weekend. Uh, in Indianapolis, we'll get to that in a minute. Arizona blasted Wisconsin, 98-73. Purdue got past Alabama, 92-86. Those teams are now, and have been uh, for, I think, 10 days now, ranked number one and number two in the top 25-1. and one. They will remain there through next Saturday's showdown because they don't play again before then. So, Norlander, I remember we were talking about a month ago or so about the weekend of December 16th. Yeah. And at the time, it looked like the CBS Sports Classic with uh, Kentucky and North Carolina might be the best game. Perhaps Kansas had Indiana, maybe Baylor, Michigan uh, State. As it is, UK, UNC will still be great. I'll be Atlanta in Atlanta for that one. Can't wait. Kansas, Indiana is now... Unfortunately, nothing more than the Jayhawks against the fourth best team from the state of Indiana <laughs> no, in program that hasn't finished in the top 25 at Ken Palm since 2016. Still interesting, but less so. Baylor, Michigan State, now nothing more than a Bears team that is great, but will be playing a Michigan State team that uh, lost uh, four of its first eight games this season. So at this point, it's clear Arizona Purdue will be game of the weekend. The winner should be number one in the AP poll when it updates on December 18th. Deadleg, we can preview and predict Arizona Purdue on Friday. For now, just tell me what you thought of Zach Eady's 35 point effort in Toronto against Alabama. I will, but here's a note to anyone that uh, if if you can be on the live show Friday, try and do so because it is a loaded weekend, and uh, I, I, we're gonna have the most to talk about outside of Final Four and one picks that we've had. So if you can hop in on the Friday live show when we go up, let's look back at what we just saw here uh, between both of these Arizona less so, but Alabama too is what we got to, what we got to lock in on. Um, the biggest thing for me with Edie was him going 11, 11 from the free throw line, uh, which I think was a, was a major factor among other ones that led to Purdue getting the win. This was one of the three most entertaining games. I want to say so far this season, Mark Sears had 35 points. I think Mark Sears. I think there's a good chance that Mark Sears, who was 8 of 16 from three-point range and had a career-best 35, he might have the best performance in a losing effort from any guard we'll see this regular season. He was outstanding, and Alabama had to rely on him, especially um, right now Pringles still continues to be out and suspended, so Alabama was shorthanded in this game, uh, but really threatened to steal it. Edie going 11-11 from the foul line. It was the most makes from the foul line without a miss since Robbie Hummel went 12-12 Back in February 2010. Uh, oh, by the way, Edie passed Hummel for 10th on the all-time scoring list at Purdue. He finished with 30. Hummel was, on, was Hummel on the call for that? He was on the call. I was yeah. watching him. Yeah, him and Benetti had a had a had a great call. I love the Benetti line, by the way. Uh, he was sneaky. It was in the first half. He's like, under a underreported aspect to Zach Edie's story, but you may not know he once played baseball, which is ex tongue firmly planted in cheek because it has been mine included a defining feature of every <laughs> every profile written about Zach Eady. Um, but yeah, no Hummel was on the call 
And uh, he took it in stride. Like, what are you going to do? Like, you know, it's it, it, it no doubt means something. If you can, if you can go to college and be on the top 10 all time scoring list where you played, that's an incredible achievement. And then a guy like Zach Eady comes along and he's going to just, he's going to, you know, storm his way to top five territory. And he, and Hummel also said on the broadcast, um, one, he said, Zach Eady is cruising to a second straight national player of the year, which is undeniably true at this point. Um, he is firmly number one. Uh, he also said he thinks Edie's the second best player in mm -hmm. program history to Big Glenn dog. Robinson, to Big Dog. Yep, and I think that is fair in the moment when he said that. I thought, hmm, I think I think that's fair in the moment. Uh, if Edie wins Player of the Year again, he's going to be number one. Big Dog never did that. Um, you went back to back Player of the Years. Uh, you're going to be the best player in program history. So uh, he he looked terrific. Braden Smith's play though, GP. Uh, we have to highlight this: 27 points, eight dimes, only one turnover. He had a couple of really gorgeous plays. He was working in pick and roll masterfully, and. His play combined with and Purdue still is not getting like every night is not a well, damn, dude. It was one through seven, like all down the line. They were kicking ass. It wasn't that it was a lot of it was a lot of Smith, like lawyer up and down. They get they get, you know, Gillis had a big three at one point in the game. Um, Colvin's playing well. Lance Jones has he's got he's got some opportunistic ways about him. Uh, the transfer from Southern Illinois. Uh, I, I was impressed with the way that Purdue was able to win the game because Alabama making 19 threes on them and just launching shot after shot after shot and feeling it the way they were feeling it. I thought there was a, I thought they had a real chance to, to steal this one, but it's just not, it's just wasn't meant to be. Um, Bama's got more opportunities coming Oh, by the way, but it's like losing all these like really good resume building opportunities. I think it's at Creighton next weekend. Again, another game we'll preview on the Friday show. Um, big win for Purdue as it continues to keep its uh, keep its spot there. You mentioned you have them one and two in your rankings. It will not be that way uh, when the poll fresh refreshes on Monday because voters aren't going to jump Purdue from four to two. Uh, so we will miss out, I think, on what would have been the 43rd all-time one versus two matchup this weekend. So it goes. What were your thoughts on that game? Well, yeah, Sears was awesome in defeat. Uh, Braden Smith, terrific. Greg Doyle had a long column about him in the Indianapolis Star. Um, but, but, you know, I, we shouldn't normalize what Zach Eady is doing. It's like, oh, he got 35. He, of course he did. He's great. I mean, 35 points in a college basketball game is crazy. Like, that's not normal. <laughs> he got 35, 7, and 2. His career high, by the way, is 38 last January, and it went over Michigan State. So I was it, there. Yes. Oh, look at I you. I was at that game. Yep. So, um, in this one, he was 12 of 20 from the field, 35.7 rebounds. He's now averaging, think about this, he was the unanimous runaway national player of the year last season. He's now averaging a career high 24.8 points, plus 10.8 rebounds, and a career high 2.6 blocks in 29.1 minutes per game. He's shooting 63% from the field. That's 2.3 percentage points higher than he shot last season from the field. And, like you noted, Career high 75.9% from the free throw line after going 11 and 11, 11 for 11 against Alabama. I saw you on CBS Sports Network Saturday night discussing this. You were terrific, by the way. One of the points you made was that um, you thought Matt Painter would might might be most thrilled about the 11 11 for the free throw line because that's a massive advantage to have if you're Purdue. You've got the best player in college basketball who doubles as a seven foot four center. He's obviously going to get the ball a lot. He's obviously going to get fouled a lot. He goes to the free throw line on average 11.6 times per game, and he's making more than three out of every four on average. Like that, 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 in, in a different time, in a different space, like throwing the ball to your big time center could lead to a hack of Shaq or a hack of Andre Drummond or a hack of anything. And with Zach Eady, it's just not a strategy because. You can put him at the free throw line all you want. He's going to sit there and make three out of four of them. Yeah. I, listen, I don't know if Edie will have another game this season where he gets at least 10 foul shots and makes all of them or, you know, 10 for 11, 12 for 14, something like that, or 14 for 15. But um, they needed him there. And Edie's ability to to draw fouls and even like his shot, the way he shoots the foul shot, he's just, just a nice little mini rainbow to it. And it goes in way more than it doesn't. Purdue is continuing a trend that it had last season. So last season, I don't have the data right in front of me, but last season, Purdue comfortably, comfortably made more foul shots than opponents took. And that's where we are again right now. So as of Sunday night, Purdue has made 195 foul shots. Opponents have taken 147. And if you watch the games and you watch the flow and how this is happening, uh, Edie is inducing plenty. Um, 
I, there's there's been a little bit of conversation about how he's officiated on both ends of the floor. I, I got to be honest, like he's not an easy guy to to blow the whistle on. I get that. I don't find it to be egregious. I actually think officials, for the most part, are doing a pretty good job with both of this. And Edie's uh, his 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 knack for how to move around the rim on both ends of the floor. He just still doesn't get enough credit for this. I, I went into a little bit of detail on it when I wrote the feature on him last season, but he's got wonderful touch good spatial awareness for just how friggin' big he is. And even like the play, there was a play that um, really helped propel Purdue to the win. Uh, Braden Smith almost had like a last second, no look pass in transition to Edie, uh, just sliced it right through the Alabama defense. Edie catches it in stride, gets a bump, soft touch off the glass, uh, almost, uh, frankly, almost looked like, you know, uh, a normal person shooting on an eight foot hoop with the way that he was able to just kiss it like that. Um, but his, it didn't look clunky. It looked in motion. And small plays like that further indicate to me that Edie's skill set, as I expected this season, and he's not flawless. Like there are times where occasionally he can look a little clunky out there and you don't want him getting caught in a ball screen, you know, 18 feet from the hoop. Uh, he does a lot there and, and Purdue's ability to capitalize on that, I think is pretty significant combined with the fact that the team collectively is shooting more reliably from three point range this season. So yes, Edie is, uh, we shouldn't normalize what he's doing. He's an abnormal player. And Purdue to be at this point, the Northwestern loss stings a little bit, but road loss, league opponent, Northwestern could be in the tournament. It's far from the worst thing in the world. Um, credit to Chris Foreman, who had this note. Purdue's played four of the nation's top 14 offenses at the time of the game. Those teams are Gonzaga, Marquette, Iowa, and Bama. And every time, and every, each of those games, Purdue has held uh, all of those teams to below what they were averaging going in. So you're getting a lot there. And I thought that was I thought that was an important morale building win for Purdue because we'll see what happens with the Arizona one. Um, I was talking with Wally Zerbiak kind of in between hits, and he's extremely curious about the Arizona game because uh, he and Chris Walker were kind of thinking like, you know, it could be competitive, but you tell me Arizona beats Purdue by 12 points. They, they, they aren't going to be surprised, which isn't to say that's what they're picking, but we we're just kind of talking about personnel and, and strategy and all that. If that were to happen, the point I'm making here is that getting the win the way that it did against Alabama, um, it, you know, it, it really helps the overall resume and and w wouldn't mean that Purdue isn't for real if for, for whatever reason Tommy Lloyd's team goes in and kicks ass again just the way that it did against another Big Ten team, Wisconsin, on Saturday. Um, on Edie, and I don't recall if it was Robbie or maybe when they went back to the studio, I apologize, but somebody made the point that when people say, oh, he's good because he's tall. It's just the dumbest thing in the world. And I run into it all the time. Anytime I write anything about Zach Eady in the top 25, one or anywhere else, not every time, but lots of times somebody will be, oh, he's, he's just, he's just tall. Oh, he's just tall. He's not a good basketball player. He's just tall. And then it's just so obviously stupid. He's an awesome college basketball player. And I do think he's going to be in the NBA. Like, I don't know where he'll get picked, but I think you'll, you'll be randomly on league press on some Tuesday night. And you'll be like, oh, wow. So Zach, he plays for the Pistons. That's cool. You know, it'll be one of those. No, well, I don't know if it's cool if he's on the Pistons, but yeah. maybe any other. Team. I don't want him on the Pistons. Okay. I take that back. I'm Zach, sorry. We are rooting for you. I, although it's close. It's, it's a, it's a quick little jaunt to your hometown of Toronto. Uh, we're going to enthusiastically root for you to land on any team other than Detroit. Oh, wow. Look, Zach, he's on the Raptors. There you go. Oh, uh, it, oh, wow. I didn't realize that, but there he is. Remember how great he was in college. He's terrific. Uh, yeah. college basketball player and he is you mentioned uh zach Eady played baseball it's like my new zach Eady is i can't write about zach Eady without mentioning ralph samson <laughs> it, is it is becoming a thing however it is notable samson was the last one to win multiple player of the year awards nope. wooden yeah. award 1982 1983 it'll yeah, never yeah. leave oh, my head yeah yeah well, and samson actually did it three years in a row with the multiple player of the years but you're right that is becoming a thing yep. um on purdue because you're right. I don't believe when the AP poll updates on Monday, it's going to be number one, Arizona, and number two, Purdue. But that is what the top 25 and one has been. And it has been since the day Purdue lost at Northwestern because I only dropped the Boilermakers. Remember, down to number two at that point, moved Arizona up to number one. And so my rationale was, have you looked at their wins? And this is why I think if Purdue does win um, in Indianapolis against Arizona, they should jump all the way to number one. Because right now, Purdue has wins over four teams ranked in the top 15 at Ken Palm. Number five, Marquette. Number nine, Tennessee. Number 10, Gonzaga. Number 13, Alabama. You ready for this? Nobody else in the top 10 of the AP poll, which means nobody else in the country, has more than two. You're right. Yeah. All right? So if Purdue beats Arizona without looking at what else could go on around the country, they will have 
five wins over top 15 Kimpom team. That's another thing, by the way, that makes what Edie's doing remarkable. He ain't doing this against the schedule. I say this respectfully, but like yeah. that, Houston, that Houston's played so far or Baylor's played so far. I mean, they have played Marquette, Tennessee, Gonzaga. They played some of the best teams in the country. And he's just overwhelming them the way he overwhelms just about everybody. So if Purdue is sitting here after next Saturday as a one-loss team, and oh, by the way, the lone loss on the road to a league opponent, top 50 team in overtime. Was it last year when we were able to keep saying Purdue hadn't lost an o- is the only team in the country hadn't lost an o- in regulation? Was that last year with them? There was a team recently. Can't remember. Florida State hasn't lost in overtime in like 15 no, years. No, no, no. I don't mean it like that. I mean, I know, I know. only it's lost over the I season. I might be right. Oh, well, yeah, Chris, Purdue is roll. Uh, yeah. No, I don't. I can't remember what team it was. It might have been Purdue, but. It was not Purdue because I'm looking in their first oh, loss. Was not in overtime. I, I remember it came up. I there just was a team that like yeah. you could you could keep saying and you realize their only loss is overtime loss. They've never lost in regulation. Um, Purdue is that right now. They haven't lost in regulation and they're going to have at least two and probably three better wins if they beat Arizona than anybody else in the country. And that's why I do believe the winner of the Purdue Arizona game should be ranked number one in the AP poll when it updates on December 18th, real quick on Arizona. Yep. So you mentioned this on CBS sports network. I I think uh, you were asked like impressive or just sort of, um, you know, just business as usual, I think was business as usual. Right. And you were like, just just business as usual. Cause it really is. They just went out there and blasted Wisconsin. And and by the way, Wisconsin has double digit wins over Marquette, Virginia, and Michigan state and Arizona just embarrassed them. Wisconsin's 14th at Ken Palm right now. Arizona smoked them. So if you remove preseason bias, I don't know if you know, if you can do this, but over at Bart Torvik.com, Arizona is 12th at adjusted offensive efficiency. And second in adjusted defensive efficiency, Arizona, Purdue, and one more school. See if you can guess it. There are three schools that are top 15 in both. If you remove was, preseason was bias, BYU going into this, it's, it's still BYU. Yeah, yeah, it's still BYU. So it's Arizona, Purdue, BYU. Only teams top 15 in both offense and defense. If you move, if you remove preseason bias. And how about this? Um, against Wisconsin, Caleb Love, 20 points while shooting above 50% from the field. All right. He's now done that twice in eight games at Arizona, scored at least 20 don't, while shooting no, at don't least. Don't even tell me he didn't do it once last season. Trivia time. <laughs> it's a trivia time. Okay. How many times last season at North Carolina did Caleb Love score at least 20 points while shooting at least 50% from the field? I'm going to say zero, and that is in that is a high indictment. If it's true. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm saying zero. You are wrong. He did it twice. Right. Oh, He, he did, did it twice in 33 games. <laughs> He's now done it twice in just eight games at Arizona. He's averaging 14.1 points, five rebounds, 4.5 assists, 1.6 steals. Shooting, you ready for this? A career high 41.5% from the field. He is the leading scorer on the number one team in the country after being the guy who was sort of the face of the UNC disaster last season. Good for him. Yeah, and he's still he's keeping it under two turnovers a game, which is big because the past three seasons, 3.1, 2.7, 2.4, it's been going down. Now it's under two. Uh, very good for him. This is a this is a this is a feel good story that is playing out before our eyes here because uh, and and I and I did mention this on the on the show on Saturday as well. Tommy Lloyd, I talked with him about Caleb Love, uh, like. Uh, like middle of the summer and then again uh, surrounding the Duke game. And he just, he kept, you know, it was just almost like casual. He was like, man, I, like I'm aware of why some fans uh, might've been hesitant. And I get why the occasional media person or two <clears throat> might've criticized the move, but this guy has done everything we've asked. There hasn't been a complaint. There's been zero entitlement. Um, and there is no evidence to the contrary to this point. So credit to Caleb Love. He is a major factor on Arizona doing this. And then, oh, by the way, you get stuff like Pella Larson going for a personal best 21 against Wisconsin. Team shoots 58% overall, you know, bangs home 12 triples. They they hit and um, 
Wally was saying, man, it's 26 assists on 35 made buckets and like so many of them look good. It's true. They only had seven turnovers in the game. It was on the home floor. Wisconsin, but my point is Wisconsin, I think Wisconsin is going to be single digit seed and we could get to March and we look up and we're like, yeah, that's a six seed and Arizona just rolled. They just rolled this team by 25 back in December. Highly impressive. And they will hold on to the number one ranking, of course, and when the polls refresh on Monday. They handled prosperity well. Hadn't been ranked in almost a decade in the top spot in the AP rankings, and it sets up for just a dynamite matchup in Indianapolis on Saturday. It will be awesome. Arizona versus Purdue in Indianapolis on Saturday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. If you don't have a Peacock subscription, you better uh, get one. Yeah. Well, well, let's deal with that on Friday's show. But that is Arizona, Amazon, Purdue. Amazon oh. Peacock, yeah. I got people already tweeting me about it. Can you like it's 2023, bro? If you can't stream something, I don't know what you're doing. All right, how you watching Squid Game? And, and in fact, I I wound up streaming uh, the Bronny James debut on Sunday, so that's why you need to best repair. Which reminds me, I think I think we need a word from our partners. Give me a word, partners. Come on, partners. You need the sports news anywhere? We've got breaking news to bring you. Then get your sports anytime you want them. Big trade news overnight to discuss. Because we know you need sports all the time. A lot of movement in the rankings this week. A legend adds to their legacy. We're bringing you that breaking news right here on HQ. CBS Sports HQ, anywhere, anytime, all the time. That's the new game, just abruptly out of nowhere. I, I, just I, yell for a word from our partners and see how quickly Nada can get to it. it. You are correct. That is that is. I'm gonna start I hate you both. Partner. <laughs> I'm going to start calling it calling it my partner like it's my spouse. Okay. Can I get a word from my spouse? <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, it is weekend. It is weekend. Whip around time. Uh, whip around time. Beep. Whip around time. Whip around nice. time. All right. Um. GP mentioned on the top, but I will at least uh, tag this with Xavier uh, beat Cincinnati. Uh, Cincinnati has not pl- won at Xavier in 22 years. Uh, so Crosstown shootout, uh, Sean Miller's team ended Cincinnati's undefeated run. And then Drake dump truck Nevada. Wolfpack got its first loss of the season. Um, let's talk Bronny James and USC here. Um, didn't see a second. I know you didn't. So I'm, I'm bringing some of the goods for you here. I saw the highlights on Twitter. That's it. So I, so I ditched, I, I did used to have Pac-12 network and then I, I went to YouTube TV, which I, I can't endorse enough, by the way. Like what I, I'm just telling you as, as, as someone who has to watch college hoops for a living and enjoys plenty of other sports, um, yeah, it's, I, I should have done this years ago. Um, but with that, I don't have Pac-12 network anymore. And, uh, bless the person that illegally streamed this on, on YouTube and, you know, our chat can be lively. This thing was a disaster. <laughs> the comment, I mean, the comments on these things are just are outrageous. That being said, USC, I watched most of this game. It blew a 45, 28 lead at home to a mid-major program, Long Beach state. It lost 84, 79 in overtime. Um, my, my, my Sahonis, Marcus Sahonis, 28 points off the bench. You'll recall him from playing at Washington once upon a win. He he had a buzzer beater to give uh, the Huskies a win. He played at VCU a couple of years ago. And now he's uh, finishing out his career with Long Beach State. Uh, Lucina Triore also had a block. He had a good game. He had a block on Isaiah Collier in overtime. I think it was the second to last possession for USC that locked up the win. Um, so there are two there's two story elements to me to me with this one. There's Bronny James making his debut, but let me just comment on USC at first here. Uh, USC is now five and four. Uh, I have whiffed on this team. I expected it to be top 10 caliber. It's not that. And it is staring down. Man, it's got two losses to mid-majors right now. And the next four games are on the road. So the Pac-12 has had this uh, this series ongoing with um, HBU, HBCU schools in the SWAC. So it's going to play at Auburn. Then it's going to stick around and play at Alabama State. And then it opens up league pay against Oregon and Oregon state to close out 2023. So this is a five and four team that's still trying to gel. And it's now got four roadies in a row. If you're a USC, you're hoping you can get out of this at seven and six and you would take eight and five and sprint. So there's a real like urgency here with USC that I did not think was going to be the case. Collier was up and down in this game. Um, As for Bronny, he makes his debut. I was rooting for LeBron James to walk in with the ski goggles straight from the Saturday night in season tournament championship and just, you know, almost like he hadn't changed. That's what I wanted to see. He was he was well attired and sitting there courtside, which was also a you didn't watch the game, so you can't identify with this GP. It was just 
it was a, a thing where I was like, I was watching the game, and every time I went up and down, of course, like, oh, yeah, LeBron's like sitting there, right? <laughs> it's like courtside right there. It's LeBron right there. Yeah, like there, he there he is. Yeah, it was just like, yep, there he is again. Um, and I tell you what, uh, I'm going to reinforce, and I said this on HQ on Sunday, uh, the fact that he's playing is an awesome story because unfortunately, man, this part sucks. It really does, man. Um, the fact that he is playing this early is uh, is a minor miracle. Uh, his heart stopped, had to be taken to the hospital. Could have, you know, I don't want to say easily, but it's not hard to imagine how that incident might have ended his professional dreams forever, but it didn't. He's playing. That is an amazing story. He played 16 minutes. He came off the bench, of course, which was to be expected. Um, and he had four points, two rebounds, two dimes, two steals, one of which was actually big. He had a he had a big block as well early in the game. And he did, he had a he had a two-shot uh free throw opportunity in regulation. Had he made both, maybe USC gets the win. He went for one for one from the line. Uh, but what I was alluding to as I uh as I uncoiled that off the top is a lot of people are gonna take a lot of online joy in USC losing or Bronny, you know, not setting the world on fire. Um, I don't want to give those people too much airtime, but I want to at least acknowledge it here because he finally played. And I saw a lot of this in the aftermath. Um, just a reminder that this podcast, me and GP have talked about Bronny as we should. He's one of the most famous players in the sport. Uh, and but put reasonable expectations and parameters around who he is. OK, we have never said that we expected him to be one of the best freshmen in the country. Uh, I told you that he if it went well, he'd be the fourth best, most important player on USC's roster. And maybe it winds up being that way. Uh, he had some good moments. He got some good burn. I think he had his first ever press conference. Oh, by the way, on Sunday, I can't ever recall him having a presser, but he did. He did the post game availability and thank the doctors, et cetera, et cetera. It was his first time sitting in front of assembled media. And, um, Enfield did not indicate what his minutes restriction was in this game, but said he didn't cross it and he didn't say what it would be for the next game. But you got four road games, a lot of travel upcoming. Um, I wouldn't expect him to play more than 20 minutes a game for the rest of 2023. Maybe he blows through that. I don't know. Um, I liked what he saw. I liked what I saw from him, relatively speaking. He didn't set the world on fire. I don't expect him to. Kobe Johnson, Isaiah Collier, Boogie Ellis, they're all better players, and USC needs those guys to play more consistently if it's going to be a tournament team. Right now, like I think it's going to get there, but it ain't there right now. Two home losses to mid-majors. I know you didn't see the game, so I, I did the heavy lifting there, but your thoughts on anything surrounding USC and Bronny James from Sunday? I only saw highlights on Twitter many, many years ago. I reached out to somebody who worked at the uh, in the Pac-12 office, and I said, hey, you guys kind of got a problem. Your fans are always telling us that we have East Coast bias, and I don't mean just me and Norlander, but all of us who cover college basketball. Your fans are constantly telling us we have East Coast bias. Now, I live in the central time zone in the southern part of the United States, so I don't know where they're getting that from, but either way, you get the point. The problem is we can't get Pac-12 network. I've got direct TV. My bill's like 200 something dollars a month. I I... I got every channel. You're shooting low on that, my friend. I think like you, I think you've come on this podcast and said I pay 700 a month for cable. Come at no, me. It's like two. It's like 280. It, it's gotten into three. You know, when you start throwing in MLB subscription and NBA league pass and used to Sunday ticket, like it just. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of money on Directv. So um, I say, listen, I can't get it. I got every. I got literally every channel Directv offers. Can't get yours. I said, if you guys ever thought it's just an idea, I'm giving it to you for free. I'm like, pretty good thinker i was just thinking maybe one way to get it where people because you guys are always like y'all don't watch our games maybe one way to help us watch your games is you ever have to think about getting like a media login to the pac-12 network so we could all watch your games and i swear to god i thought this was wild uh they emailed me back the next day and said yeah we're not going to do that and now they don't have a league <laughs> and now your league's dead it's like that meme with the domino <laughs> the small and domino now your league's the big dead. one <laughs> Gary Paris. Now your league's dead. Gary Paris sent an email in 2018. I killed the Pac-12. People don't people don't talk about that enough. I set it in motion. I saw it coming. Uh, it won't come off a media login for your stupid network. Well, now you don't have a league. Congratulations. All right. In all seriousness, this is what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Because the point I had made previously about Bronny James is um, I don't think he should be in the starting lineup based on just what I know about USC's roster based on ability. I would not have I I would not have started him if you if you changed his name to something other than Bronny James. All right. But I thought that he would be force played a little bit because he is Bronny James. Then he had a heart issue and he's missed a ton of practice and games. And I 
told you on a recent podcast, I've talked to enough coaches over the years. When freshmen start having to join the team late or miss a lot of practice, unless it's like a Kevin Durant level talent, it's going to cost them. Like they, it's hard to miss time and then catch up, particularly when you're playing at a place like USC that's got other good players, including maybe the number one pick in the draft and maybe a guy who could be um, the Pac-12 player of the year in Boogie Ellis, although I know we're not headed that direction right now. So I thought it was interesting. And I, I have nothing more than a Seth Davis tweet that informed me that Bronny James was playing clutch time in a close game for USC in his first game back. Was it the appropriate thing to do because he gave you the best chance to win? Or were you trying to force feed, force play rather, LeBron's kid in his first game back in crunch time because you felt compelled to do so? Watching the game, it felt like he should have been on the floor. Okay. Close the game and play in overtime. That's no. fine. I had no yes. con. I don't know. Yeah, so yeah, I'm no, trusting it's you. Important question to ask. Yeah. Uh, people that are listening or watching, I guess, might disagree, but I don't think so. If you watch the game, you watch how USC was playing. It felt like he should have been on the floor. Um, but there, that is an intriguing dynamic to all of this. Is Andy Enfield is now certainly? I mean, he's just trying to get this team to win games, be relevant in the Pac-12, and can get into the NCAA tournament. And he's got a roster situation in a and something with his coaching career that he's never had before. Um, and I don't think that LeBron James, uh, by any means, I'm serious on this, has has gone or will go to the coaching staff and say, you know. Hey, I do this, or what are we thinking with this with Bronny? I th I think he's by all accounts. I haven't heard a, a whiff. He's been of that. running an NBA franchise for twenty years, telling people what to do. I think it's different <laughs> when it's. I know, but I think it's. I agree. I actually agree run. with you. I, do, I actually I agree with you, and I think he wants Bronny to go through this. Uh, but it's it's a very valid point that you bring up there. No, um, I, I agree with you in the sense that I do not think LeBron has done that. I'd be surprised if he would do that. Yes. But if you're Andy Infield. I think you feel it. It's still that's what I'm it's saying. Still like, it's there. still It's still here. Like yeah. there's still part of that, and you know there's a minutes restriction. There's, and then you know it's, considering the situation out over the summer, uh, very fascinating dynamic. Uh, we will see where it goes from here. But boy, oh boy, four road games in a row. Mm. USC is going to be up against it, and it would be good for the sport if USC was good and Bronny James was good and it was relevant. Um, because let's, let's face it, um, that uh, that has real. Uh, appeal and USC has the talent to do it. We'll just see, we'll just see on that. Um, but I hope our listeners and viewers can appreciate that. While it's a newsworthy event, no, by no means in hell were we opening our show on what Bronny James and USC did uh, there. But is nonetheless big enough to open the whip around with. Uh, can I keep rolling? Please do. Okay, uh, Pac-12. Uh, you mentioned Utah knocked off BYU. More of us. Colorado won ninety to sixty three over Miami on Sunday. Without Cody Williams, oh, by the way, uh, Kempom might be throwing a party right now, for all we know. Uh, Miami goes down, and okay. then Washington, Washington beat Gonzaga 78-73. Um, so it was a, it could have been a better week for the Pac-12 because you had USC losing. The, the LA schools both went down. Um, UCLA, I mean, it tripped over its shoelaces in the second half against Villanova. Uh, which temporarily like is going to ease tensions on the main line. Nova's now seven and four. It closed the game on a 24, 11 run and won 65, 56 at home. Um, but UCLA hasn't beaten a top 50 Ken Palm team. Uh, Mick Cronin went after a Dembona after the game that certainly received some attention. Um, so an interesting weekend for the pack 12 overall. Let me stop you there. Okay. I think a lot of people have seen the clip. Was he going after his players or he was talking about a Dembona, um, because he was talking about he wants more out of Bona. Like Bona's UCLA's best player. And from an effort standpoint, from a stat standpoint, he did not provide enough to give UCLA a chance to win. And and um and and Cronin, who has been on his team this year, as 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 an oh by the way, um, he's just if you've watched UCLA play or if you've attended the games, like you know, we don't really know what UCLA will be this season. And Cronin has definitely looked he has looked angsty, more angsty than normal. Um, so while he, yeah, like he said. What did he say? Eric Dixon isn't a great athlete. And, Ty and Tyler Burton, it's, this dude played four years at Richmond. I mean, Burton had 18 and 10. So he was using other, like, it's not a great look. I'm not going to sit here and say the best coach in UCLA history had a great look with this. But he was saying, like, if you're going to take these two players and look at look at what look what you're capable of, and we didn't have it there, he was calling out his own guy and in the process pissed off the entire Villanova fan base. In the process. He caught, like they were catching strays in Villanova because yeah, it was like the way and, – and I didn't see the entire press conference. I just see the clip. But the way the clip portrays it is more – if I if somebody said, hey, you watch that, what do you think McCrone is trying to say? 
the way the clip portrays it is he's trying to say, Jesus Christ, this guy played four years at Richmond and you can't go grab a ball. That's what he was. That, that's the way it comes across. It's basically that. And and you will not hear me complain at all. I want no, I, I want as it. much unfilteredness at the podium from every head coach at all times. OK, give it to me consistently. Cronin, UCLA, take a loss. Uh, thoughts on on Washington beating the Zags, though, GP? I mean, they do a storm, a floor storming. Keon Brooks played well. Sevier Wheeler, a couple of Kentucky guys, obviously up there. Uh, they rallied. They were down 11. They wound up winning the game 78-73. It was uh, the first win for Washington over the Zags. Trivia. I didn't have one, but I have one. Trivia time last time it happened. Do you know it? Last year. Well, I, I, I bet I know who was responsible for it. I think you can get that. That's not the trivia time, though. Lorenzo. Mr. Romar was the coach. I'm going to say that was probably, oh, hell, that feels like it was 2009. Oh, five, my friend. Oh, five was the last time UW took out Gonzaga, did it in Seattle, and uh, it was their first top 10 win as a program, UW, since 2018. Any just quick thoughts on any? No uh, no, no thoughts on the game, but I um, I, like like Mike Hopkins, and he's obviously in a season where he needs to win, and so I'm not staying up late on a Saturday night going, oh, man, come on, Mike Hopkins, if you don't get this one – uh, you you could be on Peacock next year, you know. Like I'm not, I, but I do like you it. Mean as an analyst and not coaching in a game. Is That's that what, what I mean? mean. Okay. Yes. And but so I, I I like it anytime hot seat coaches get off to nice starts. And I know they're just I think still six and three, but a win over, you know, the biggest basketball brand in your state and one of the biggest basketball brands in the country. Um, yeah, storm the court. You should. Feels good. Where's Gonzaga rank for you? I did drop them. Let me let me get you an update. You look that up, and as we whip, continue to whip around, I feel like use a little bit of a soundtrack here just to wrap it up here. Um, drop them down. Drop them down to twelve. Okay. Um, feels like they're not a top twelve team, but maybe they have a top 10, 12 resume, which is two different things there. Um, Okay, a uh, couple more results here. Illinois, Tennessee. That game was on CBS. Terrence Shannon Jr. had twenty two points, but guess what? Tennessee. Got a much needed win. Vols were uh, were a good second half team and uh, a good overall performance there for Tennessee. Um, Illinois, t- it, you take it the whole way. I mean, they in terms of they won at Rutgers, they beat FAU on a neutral, had two really good performances, two and one on that three game stretch the whole time. Tennessee gets itself a season steadying win in my opinion. So that I thought that was pretty uh, pretty notable. Memphis won at Texas A and M on Sunday. Penny Hardaway's team somewhat quietly building out. Uh, a nice little name for itself here. David Jones, Parrish had this in the preseason. Uh, he should be slept on no more. He went for 29. Javon Quinley had 24 in this one. Um, Memphis is is the real deal and the best team in its conference, not named FAU. Will it be the best team, period? That could be a fun little league race that uh, that is developing, which wouldn't be a surprise, but I'm liking what I'm seeing from Memphis right now. And it doesn't even have its whole roster. Um I mean, real quick on this, I don't even know if you know, like, is Jordan Brown not on the team? Is that still a mystery? Do we have any sort of status update on on that? Because he was expected to be, you know, a top five player of importance. There is no official update on it. Uh, the story is Jordan Brown was supposed to be Memphis's best player. Like, if you'd have asked anybody on the day Jordan Brown committed, who's going to be Memphis's best player? It have been like, looks like it's Jordan Brown. He's been terrific at Louisiana. In fact, I was like texting with Bob Marlin back in the offseason. And he was like, by the way, Jordan Brown's going to be great at Memphis. He wasn't even like... I can't believe they came in here and got him and all that stuff. He was like, he's going to be great. And he's just hadn't been great. He looked out of shape and um, wasn't playing a lot and wasn't doing much when he did play. And then he just like suddenly missed last, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the previous game. And afterwards, Penny said, oh, yeah, he's sick and just left it there. And sort of the point I made on my show in Memphis was you don't normally hear coach college coaches just say somebody's sick and they didn't even travel with the team. <clears throat> I'll ask you, you, you covered the sport. When's the last time you remember a player, a coach saying a player did not tra- non COVID reasons. I was about to say worst pandemic. Yeah. Of our yeah, life. yeah, Let's take COVID question. out of it. Okay. Let's take COVID out of it. Um, players just sick under the weather not traveling with the team that's just not a thing you normally hear. Un- not not normal i don't want to say unprecedented i mean if guys you know puking his brains out and he can't travel with the team he can't travel he's got the flu like whatever but this one just seems a little bit i don't okay. know it's, so it's, then, it's, um, actually and i'm not going to make a mountain animal of a molehill on this i am truly not um 
but this is like it's every damn year with Memphis. There's just something there's just something with the roster and a player and availability. Like this always <laughs> happens. They're still a good team. Who the hell knows? Well, it was the same thing like two years ago with Amani Bates. It was like Amani Bates is no longer here. Yeah, they said didn't they say he was sick like one time? Then didn't, didn't they use oh, this? They said he had a back issue and he had to go yeah, home. That was the back issue. Okay. And it was like, why do you have to go home to Michigan with a back? You know, we have back doctors in Memphis. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? You gotta go. It's one thing if you go to LA to see like the specialist who works on Mookie Betts, or you go to you know in New York to see the specialist who works on Aaron Judge. Um, I had to go home to Michigan to, it was like what and then he just never came back until very late in the season this and I made this point early in the week sounded similar I was like I don't know but it's too vague to be believable that's what I said it's too vague to be believable so then there was a report out of Memphis um, that Jordan Brown is not going to return to the team the school has not confirmed it multiple beat writers who cover the program have been unable to confirm it, but Jordan Brown did not travel to Texas A&M, did not play in the game, and hilariously, <laughs> did you see the quote? I did not. <laughs> After the game, somebody, they, you know, somebody asked Penny Hardaway, so is there any update on Jordan Brown? He said, he's still sick as far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> he's still sick as far as I know is hilarious. That's sometimes people ask me about you. How's GP? He's still sick as far as I know. <laughs> as far as I know. <laughs> on David Jones? He is, it's now clear, he's Memphis's best player. Definitely. And I just started thinking about this. How was St. John's bad last year? <laughs> okay, they had Joel Soriano, David Jones, who is Memphis's best player, A.J. Storr, who is the leading scorer for a ranked Wisconsin team right now, Yeah. Posh Alexander, who is David Cobb's favorite player. <laughs> how did Golden Gate Mike have all of that? And how is that team not good? They've got they've got multiple good teams, best players. They had them last year. Can you just let Golden Gate Mike live? Just let him enjoy. How did that happen? Just let him and Corbello, who by the way is like balling right. out at I don't know where he is, <laughs> but I think it's at Southern Miss. Maybe. He? Yeah, yeah, is he still there? I thought he might have lost. I, I don't I, know. I don't. But like, yeah, they had him too. I know. How was that team not in the Final Four? It's one of the great mysteries of our age, GP. Do it 30-30 um, on 2023 St. John's. Let's not and say we did. AM, by the way, is seven and three, far from the top ten team I projected to be on Sunday. Uh Wade Taylor's had nine, Henry Coleman six, Tyrese Radford eight. Gotta do better than that, particularly on your home floor. Your what score of the weekend? And normally I would not bring this up. Um, North Dakota State. Won a game 108 to 14. You heard oh, me correct. I thought that's where you're about to talk about Auburn, Indiana. No, no, no. What? Oh. No, no. I'm staring. I'm staring. If you want to have your own personal whip around with that, you go ahead. I don't have that on the rundown here. I'm listen. There's a reason why I bring this up. 108 to 14. Period. Um, the opponent, a, a tiny school, not NCAA. I think it's NCCAA, Oak Hill Christian College. Um, People are dunking on NDSU for doing this. I mean, I've never seen a mid-major school post a score like this. It's been retweeted or quote tweeted like two and a half thousand times. As 14 of a, points. 108 to 14. Um, Buddy, I at a Christian, they're a Christian school? Hey, listen, definitely go ahead and Google yourself. We're not getting into that. Definitely one of them. Okay. Oh God, I'd be if I got if I scored only if one I got beat by a hundred in a basketball game and I played for a Christian school. Immediately, There's immediately being switch to the roster on social media. Go feel free to to do your uh, to do your own researching on that. Uh, if you're if, by the way, if you're Dave Richmond, like there's no point. In, don't schedule a game like this against a school like that. What are you doing? 108 14. You gonna turn those boys into devil worshipers. They got their brains beating so bad. Not us. That can be uh, that can I'd be guaranteed. Devil, Ohio State to Christian school and got beat by 100. Ohio State. Yikes. Maybe the worst loss of the weekend. Blew an 18-point lead at Penn State in the, in the final 15 minutes. Yuck. Penn State had lost five in a row going into this one. Buckeyes had been showing progress of late. That's either going to be a wake-up call for Chris Holtman's team or a bad harbinger of things to come in league play. But I that's among the worst losses of the weekend. The Savior Season W was on CBS Sports Network. St. Mary's at Colorado State. Gales won the game, uh, and they didn't win it. Here's the thing. They did not win it because of Aiden Mahaney, Mitchell Saxon, Alex Dukas, the three most allegedly important players. Now, Joshua Jefferson was great. And Augustus, we need more Augustuses in college. Years. Augustus, Marshall Leonis, they were the two standouts. They got it done. CSU had two opportunities, hit a three at the at the end of the game and pushed forward. Didn't happen. First loss of the season for Nico Medved's Rams. 
And St. Mary's is now just – the record says 5-5, five and five, but it is 4-5 and five as far as the committee is concerned. One of those wins are non-D1, and there's a long way to go, but St. Mary's got a, um, got a big one there. And then Great Odin's Demon! Great Odin's Demon! Jeremiah Odin finished with a game-high 22 points. And DePaul, as we told you would happen, as we told you would happen on the Friday show, went in their home arena, beat Louisville, 75 to 68 GP. I think, I think I was four and one and you were three and two. So I think we were even Steven in the final four and one. We'll update those records on Friday that we might have a side mount situation. Last game here, Michigan state four and five, same record as St. Mary's both teams ranked in the preseason. MSU was fifth. Gales were like 13, 15. I can't remember. Uh, MSU did not walk into pinnacle bank arena. Damn. Lost 77 to 70 Sunday night against Nebraska. It was a week ago on the show, I think, that we asked if Michigan State's NCAA tournament streak was in jeopardy. I said it was then. That has only been reemphasized now. Uh, Nebraska had lost 11 straight to Sparty. That's over with. Um, I was watching the back half of this game as we were even doing the show. Someone in the chat might have said Kese uh, Tominaga might have gotten hurt. If that happened, I did not, I did not see. Um, but uh, hopefully he's good. I, I I didn't catch it if that was the case, but that is a, I mean, it has slammed the panic button time for Michigan State. Sub 500 in December. Uh, I don't think that's ever happened under Tom Izzo. It might not have even happened at that school in 40 plus years. Well, when the broadcast started on Big Ten Network, they had a uh, graphic up during the game where they said Michigan State's four and four record is the worst record through eight games for a preseason top five team in the past 40 years. So imagine four and five. Eh? Yeah. That might get you. That might be, get you even to a smaller group. It's problematic. So, yeah. They're in bad shape. They I mean, are. there's no getting around that they, you know, Ken Palm projects them now to go 10 and 10 in the Big Ten, finish 17, go 17 and 14 headed into the Big Ten tournament. That won't be good enough. It's not a, uh, no, you can't go, it, Michigan State cannot go 500. It's got to be three, four games above it for sure. And did you hear, I meant to bring this up. I guess we talked about Michigan State on last Wednesday's uh, pod after maybe the Tuesday night loss to Wisconsin where they dropped the four and four. And I mentioned Tom's press conference where he said, you know, I'm confused. I didn't see this coming. Like we didn't have a bad summer. We didn't have a bad preseason. Like this is surprising to me. Another thing he said, I thought this was interesting and I'm, I forgot to bring it up in that press conference. He said, uh, one of my problems is I'm listening to too many people. He said, I'm going to get back to what I used to do. I'm paraphrasing here, but he actually said, I'm getting the shoulder pads back out and I'm going to stop worrying about the lawsuits. It, it, he indicated that he has stopped. Wait, was that a direct quote? It was something along those lines. Yes. It was like, it yeah. was like, you know, I'm going to stop worrying about the law. It, it might have been lawyers instead of lawsuits, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but it was something like, I'm going to get back to doing what I do. I'm bringing the shoulder pads out. We're going to hit yeah. each other, and I'm going. I'm not going to worry about the lawyers or the lawsuits or something like that. Yeah. He seemed to indicate I've been coaching differently because the world has changed, and I'm and I'm not as effective as I used to. Again, I'm paraphrasing and I'm I'm interpreting, but that that is the thing he seemed to suggest. I'm not coaching the way I used to coach because some people have suggested you can't coach that way anymore, and now I'm not getting the best out of my players. We will see if that winds up uh, changing anything whatsoever. They need um, they need a major pivot because when you look at the, this roster and, and what they have returning, like I, there's just no excuse for it being four and five. Someone in the chat asked, "When's the last time a Big Ten tournament team finished 500 and didn't make the tournament?" Uh, try last year, and I'll do you one better. Michigan was above 500 in the league play last season and did not get an invite, nor should it have gotten an invite to the NCAA tournament. So it has uh, it has barely been all of eight months. At uh, at this point, uh, before we get out of here, what do we got on tap here? GP Monday, Tuesday, we were in finals week. Right. Uh, I admittedly have actually not even peeked at the schedule yet, but this is the always the slowest week. Uh, even the finals don't line up for every single school in the country. This is the week where it's by far the slowest. We had a nice weekend this past weekend. We got a huge one upcoming. What's over the course of the next 40 hours? What do we got? Well, well, just real quick before that, I'd like to apologize to Illinois fans. I was going to let you out of here off the hook. I cruised no, through that. No, I'm not okay. I'm not going to ignore it. I ran the train right off the ground, right into the ditch. It's just I took over the train and then we went and we went to Thompson Bowling and just got whew. 
It's just I mean, tough, man. Yeah. It's tough. I'll do better next time. But hey, if it means anything, I didn't even drop Illinois in the top 25 and one. They were 10. They were 10 wow. on Saturday morning and they were 10 on Sunday. I'm not going to punish you for going and uh, losing a road game to a Tennessee team that's obviously good. So, uh, you know, I moved Tennessee up a little bit, kept Illinois where they were, and we'll try to drive that train a little straighter next time. Didn't go so well in Knoxville, but here's the good news. We don't have to go back to Knoxville. Sure. We don't have to go back to Knoxville. Looking ahead to the next couple of days, um, there's really nothing. Like you said, it's finals week for a lot of schools. Schedules are light. Gonzaga's the only ranked team playing Monday. They get 0-9 Mississippi Valley State. I mean, (laughs) Monday, I'm looking at it now. Okay, let's go to Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Monday. I'm, I'm yeah. going to try to finish only murders in the building season three on Monday night. It sounds yeah, like, you know what? Wife and I did season one in October and we, uh, I just did the bear season one. Great season one finale. The bear really enjoyed that. Uh, bear but, uh, season two, bear season two, better, better than bear season one. We'll, we'll get to it. But I said, listen, um, let's get through the bear. She's like, she's kind of halfway there. She's, she's all about only murders. So we're going to start only murders. I think, uh, tomorrow or Tuesday. I don't love it. It's but it's just good enough to watch. That's all it is. Just good enough to watch. I was told it gets better as each season goes along. And I thought season one was just fine. So yeah, I don't, yeah. It's one of those where I can see why some people say, "Ah, I can't stick with it. I, I like, I got two more episodes to go in season three. So that's what I'm doing Monday night. I hope Gonzaga survives Mississippi Valley State. Duke and Tennessee, only ranked teams playing Tuesday. Duke gets Hofstra. Tennessee gets 0-9 Georgia Southern. Our next ranked versus ranked game, based on the current AP poll, is until Friday. UConn, Gonzaga in Seattle. Yeah, how about that? Okay, well, that will uh, that might have to be a Friday final four and one pick. Again, though, the, the, the slate is loaded, so we will uh, we will see on that. Uh, fun little weekend there. Um yeah, I think that's all. Uh, I think that's pretty much all we got here, GP. I want to give a heads up to listeners, though, because I did hear from one of our uh, pod bosses. So two weeks from night is, is Christmas Eve. Um, we are we will absolutely not be doing a, a live show on Christmas Eve, of course. But uh, it was recommended to me that we try and bake in uh, like a hearty year end uh, mailbag app that we will probably pre tape. But we'll see on that. That being said, while we do have some questions in the queue. Shouts to CBS at gmail.com. Shouts to CBS at gmail.com. That is the word to T-O, not the number two. And then I'll collect a bunch. And uh, somewhere around the Christmas holiday, if you want to squeeze in a little uh, podcast stuff, because there's going to be a light slate, we will uh, we will attack that with uh, with a fervor unknown to mankind. So that's still two weeks out, but I want to give you plenty of lead up time. You can send it as you listen to this now or mark it down and send something, you know, December 22nd. But at least want to give you a heads up on that. We appreciate you as always. Hope everyone had a wonderful weekend. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry M. F. Antigua. He's a legend. Shouts to Huck Lardell. Thank you guys once again for watching, listening to the Eye on College Basketball podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple and Spotify. There's more of us than there are of them. But if you didn't know it before that North Dakota State game, you do now. Yes, you do. That needs to be reflected in the comments. So please do that. We'll talk to you again on Wednesday. Till then, take care.